and she'll, she knows to come up here and get you tomorrow. Yeah, so it was mostly Humphrey Okay, so it wasn't All right, I think we're going to get going here. It is two after four, so we don't want to keep uh, any of the online folks waiting. Um, welcome um, to all of you sitting in the audience, and welcome to those of you uh, watching through the live stream. Um, this is the Institute on the Environment here at the University of Minnesota. And uh, I just wanted to want to welcome everybody here this afternoon. Um, today I have the pleasure of kicking off this great event. Um, so I just have a few short words. And I want to first off start by thanking Janet and Kristen and the rest of the Climate Generation uh, group uh, on the ability and, and the offer to, to co-host this panel discussion. Um, we're really excited here at, at the Institute of the Environment to to have this happening here. So my name's Jeff Standish. I'm the manager of corporate sustainability here at the Institute on the Environment. Um, I know a number of the faces here and probably some of the folks online. But I just want to say a few quick words about what we here at the Institute uh, are, are working on these days. Um, so the Institute on the Environment is a place where students, uh, staff, and faculty from across the whole system of the University of Minnesota, all the campuses, come together to work with practitioners like we're going to be hearing from today and from all the different sectors, whether that's nonprofit, business, municipalities, to, um, to bring together work that benefits people and the planet as we move forward. That's part of our mission here at, at Institute on the Environment. So gatherings like this one are, are real important uh, as illustrating the work that we can all do collectively. And we're going to hear some great insights and some inspirational feedback and, and reflections, I think, from, from our panelists today. Um, the business delegation that just got back from COP24, welcome back. Hopefully uh, you had a wonderful trip. I, I was watching everything online and reading the blogs, and it was, certainly seemed like a, a fun, uh, fun time and also an educational time. So for me, both professionally and personally, this is exciting because I work with a lot of the folks in the business community on a daily or weekly basis and um, have been in the room with a number of the faces here a couple times already this week talking about climate change and sustainability. Um, but also just ad living quickly here, I just came from uh, my five-year-old's Christmas party at preschool <laughs> and you know I was reflecting as I was sitting in the back of a trailer on a hayride with him <laughs> about how important it is for this work and the future generations, whether they're current students here at the U or other universities, or those that are going to be coming up through different uh, pathways uh, into the society. So with that, I just want to quickly say, um, you know, before the group went over to COP24 in Poland, I had a chance to interact with them. And I am personally very interested and excited to hear about their reflections and insights over the next hour or so. And to get us going, I'm going to introduce Janet Brown, who's the Associate Director at Climate Generation and Will Seeger Legacy, to, to kick off the panel. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here, uh, both uh, those in the room and those online. We appreciate you joining us today. And thank you to INE for um, hosting us today. We really appreciate and we um, have uh, valued your partnership over the many years. So. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I uh, just wanted to take a moment um, before we uh, introduce our panel and just talk for a moment about um, uh, climate generation, our work, and also um, why we decided to take a business delegation um, to uh, Katowice, Poland this year. So just to start us off, um, uh, climate generation, our mission is to empower individuals and their communities to engage in solutions to climate change. I think many of you know that we were uh, founded by Will Seeger, and it's really been through his uh, storytelling and his eyewitness to climate change in the polar regions over 55 plus years that have, has really empowered our work. And uh, many don't realize this, but Will was also a science teacher in the classroom, and that has really infused the DNA of the work that we do. So we work with youth, uh, educators, the public, influentials, including business leaders. And we do that through three pillars, and that is building climate literacy, developing those powerful climate advocates, and also elevating that leadership. And there's probably no 
uh, program that we provide that offers that more than our COP program, which is the Conference of the Parties. We've been sending delegations um, to the Conference of the Parties since 2009. We had a youth delegation then, um, which was uh, uh, five states from the upper Midwest that traveled to um, Copenhagen for the climate negotiations when we were formerly Will Steger Foundation. Uh, we've had a number of other smaller delegations, but another large delegation we sent to uh, Paris for the uh, climate negotiations. We sent 10 educators from across the United States, and um, I was proud to help uh, co-lead that with Kristen Poppleton, our director of programs. And then uh, last year, you know, we realized with the U.S. pulling out of the climate nego uh, out of the climate agreement uh, or uh, recommending to uh, that we really needed the the um, the focus then has gone from national to really states and uh, private uh, private uh, business that is really driving the work on climate change. And so last year we sent a delegation from multi-sector, and I'm proud to see one of those multi-sector. Hi, Alan. Um, but we sent people from um, from government. We sent a middle school student, a high school student, a college student. Uh, we also had, um, and John Olson, yay, hi John, I just saw you, um, our Department of Education, we sent somebody from philanthropy and um, attorneys, we had an indigenous um, uh, youth leader who was able to participate. So we really understood that that, that was very cross-sector. This year we sent a business delegation because what we realize is with Minnesota still in, uh, or with the We're Still In campaign and with the U.S. Climate uh, Alliance, it's really a, a lot of the, um, I would say, burden of, of uh, climate support is coming from the private sector. And uh, we realized that with the, um, which is with the We're Still In campaign, that uh, that represents almost half of the U.S. economy and uh, that is still committed to taking action on climate change. And so we really felt like having business representation from a small, medium, large size um, companies, that, that that was really important for us to get that perspective of what is actually happening at the international level. And also to send the message to these international negotiations that, um, that we are still in, that we are still willing to do this work and we're still, in, uh, still willing to dig in hard. So, um, so I'll just quickly, it's really hard to take these negotiations when you've been to them. Uh, uh, it's like drinking from a fire hose. There's so much that is happening. It's really hard to kind of know where all the pieces are going to end up. And so I did want to just talk quickly. We'll we'll get into it a little bit more with our um, with our delegates. But um, it's always interesting to see uh, the sausage getting made <laughs> behind the scenes, and you just think it's not going to come together. And really, up until I will just say for these negotiations this year for COP24. Um, one of the big focuses for this negotiation is to really write the rule book. A lot of people referred to uh, Poland as Paris 2.0, and that was to really put the rule book in place of how are we actually going to hold countries to these commitments, how are we going to measure them, how are we going to enforce them, um, and how are we going to um, standardize them across. And so it was really important to put this rule book in place, and I will tell you that when the COP closed on well, when technically it was supposed to close on Friday, uh, probably 80% of this rule book was empty. And so nobody knew if this was actually going to get completed. They did work through the night, and happy to say that they did actually come out with a 156-page document that does um, indeed uh, have a path for these countries to run on. There were many countries who, uh, who worked against that, and I won't go into that right now because we'll probably come up with it with our panelists, but. Um, but there were several uh, obstructionist uh, countries that were really uh, trying to fight that. Also, that the World Bank um, is really working to double the, they doubled the target for climate finance. It had been at $100 billion. Everybody knew that wasn't enough. Um, it's at $200 billion, and, and now the question is how to hold those countries accountable to actually, um, to actually put that in place. So, um, so without too much more, I really feel like I want to uh, make sure that we have time to, um, to talk to our panelists, so I'm going to introduce them now. Uh, so first I have Alexis Ludwig-Vogan, who is our Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability from Best Buy. 
And Michelle is actually on. Oh, she is. Oh, Michelle, hi. Michelle Courtright from Fig and Faro, which is a local plant-based uh, restaurant, will also be joining us. You guys can come on up front when I. Um, and then also Jesse Turk, who is an architect and project manager at BWBR. So I'm going to have you guys come on up and join me, and we will uh, get a chance to have a little bit more of a conversation. So. Hi, good to see you. Good, good to see, see you. you. Welcome back. <laughs> Great. Come on over, Alexis. Great. So, um, and we will also have. I think there were cards that were and pencils that were passed around in the audience. But if you uh, don't have one, feel free to raise your hand. We'd love to get questions from the audience. But we wanted to get our panel started off, and so we asked a couple questions to get them started. And that is, what is the most impactful infor or informative experience you had at COP24, as well as what are the specific learnings you're bringing back to your business? And so, Alexis, if you don't mind, I'll start with you and just have you do a little synopsis of that. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Our team is super enthusiastic. <laughs> um, so first, I, I just can't start without saying I'm so grateful to Climate Generation for this opportunity. Um, it, you told me before I left that this would be kind of a life changer, and um, I absolutely, I think it, it's in that category. It was, it was an amazing experience, and I'm, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity. And, and the foresight that you guys had in sending businesses, which I think is a it was a unique uh, voice there, so that's mm -hmm. kind of part of what I'll talk about a little bit. Um, or just, it's not a um, large voice mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So for me, one of the things that kind of went over the whole week and the whole experience when I was there was just that sense of urgency. Um, I feel like here in our enclave of Minnesota, uh, while, while we have a lot of amazing work going on here, um, and amazing progress on climate and a lot of um, leaders in the climate uh, world here in Minnesota. It just, we don't see as many of the impacts. And you, when I was there, I, I felt like I heard more of those stories from other countries and I felt the sense of urgency. And especially just the, the IPCC report that came out, I think that that kind of set a tone. Um, certainly for the second week um, when, when we were there, I think, I think that was, Definitely something that I took away from the week. Um, but I also then saw that there were so many people at the conference that are there working really hard on this issue. Um, and that was something that was um, ultimately, when I reflected on that, it was something that was like of solace to me. Um, as well as the fact that I think that now, um, I heard some people kind of saying, oh, what if we haven't made progress and you know, the emissions are going up and I, 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 I get it, that's happening. But on the other hand, there has been progress, I think. Um, maybe not in the actual emissions, but I think there's been a lot of progress on the technology side and the solution side. And we're now at this point where we need to just take those um, those solutions that I think now have kind of been proven out and we need to scale them. And I think that's where it was so interesting to be at this, um, at, a, at a government level and to see that and to think about the interaction between how government is a role there and how um, government can either, and good policy can either slow down the progress or speed up the progress of the adoption of this new technology. And I mean, I, I really believe that those solutions, they're gonna, they're gonna come. Mm -hmm. They're gonna come no matter what, um, but it's about timing. And that good policy um, and commitment from these governments will really, that'll, it'll make a difference on when, when it happens. Um, so I think um, you asked also what I'm going to bring back to Best Buy. Mm -hmm. um, we've, you know, we've had a carbon program since 20, 2009, essentially. And um, so we, we are still absolutely committed to reducing emissions in our operations. We're working on a goal to reduce emissions for our customers. And 
what I am going to bring back from this whole experience is, um, again, that sense of urgency, right? That um, there are days that, for me, I, I need that pick-me-up to keep going and to keep pushing for those solutions. And without a doubt, last week um, was the um, validation of, yep, this still, this really needs to be done and we need to continue to push forward with, with more and more solutions. So it kind of gave me a bit more strength and, a, and I think some more stories to share um, internally on uh, what to do, how we need to continue to pursue and go forward. Thanks a lot, <laughs> appreciate that. Wonderful, Michelle. Oh and yeah, for sure, the button there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, echoing what Alexa said, um, definitely we uh, really appreciate the opportunity from climate generation because uh, this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. It was really amazing and uh, very humbling to go to a conference where everybody you meet is a, you know, a legislator from the Netherlands and a senator from Nigeria and, you know, all of these people that are incredible and, and doing really incredible things. So that was. Very cool. Um, I own a plant-based restaurant and um, a couple of years ago I was doing some research and realizing the connection that uh, food has on climate change and uh, especially um, kind of the livestock industry. It, it's one of the biggest contributors and, and um, so, you know, our organization is committed to learning more about it and educating um, our guests. and. Um, when I got in there, I uh, really just met some amazing people. Um, some of the data that we use in our restaurant is um, from Oxford University, and so I got to meet Marco Springman, who is kind of the lead researcher on, on food and, and climate. Uh, so that was like a starstruck moment. That was really, uh, really cool. Uh, and then I got to meet all of these wonderful organizations that are doing uh, work in the food um, uh, sphere. So we had a lot of people from um, Forward Food, uh, the Animal Humane Society uh, International, um, Greenpeace was there. Uh, there's an organization called Plant for the Planet and their goal is to, um, this is astounding, plant three trillion trees. Uh, it's expected to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, by 25% if we can uh, plant three trillion trees. Uh, so. Those type of efforts were just um, really, really cool. Um, one of the most surprising things, it took my breath away when I heard this, because uh, you know you get here and you're inspir you know, feeling inspired and, and uh, feeling like you want to change the world. And I was sitting, uh, having lunch with this gentleman who was from an uh, investment firm and he was talking about, um, you know, he kind of runs institutional uh, climate change investments and family offices and things and he said well you know it's pretty silly that we're here talking about one one and a half degrees uh, because he's like in our projections we're not even looking th at that anymore we're looking at six degrees and it was just astounding to hear that language come out of somebody in, in this conference that I thought we were so hopeful um, later you heard the president of the Maldives who, who was saying you know, c cops have been going on for so long and, and, you know, here we're squabbling over the word welcome and note and, you know, things like that. He, and he's like, we can't go at this pace anymore. We have to, so it was really uh, interesting. A lot of people were saying, well, it's up to the businesses. And so it's kind of cool to be in this delegation and really understand that it is um, probably, you know, very much, a, you know, NGOs and private sector that are going to, uh, do the heavy lifting because unfortunately, um, especially our administration is not uh, keen on acting on it um, right now. So, so yeah, but it was an amazing, <coughs> amazing experience. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Michelle. We'll hear more. Yeah. I, Jesse? All right. Um, I guess I'm now questioning my decision to sit on the end. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I guess I'd like to start off and just thank Climate Generation because, again, it was an amazing amazing experience. Um, and then just a few of the things that I took away was uh, just meeting all the amazing people from all over the world that they have different backgrounds, different industries, but just everyone, uh, well, I'll say almost everyone working towards the same, uh, the same goals from different directions. 
and then just the, the sense of urgency and you know, hopefully all the little actions add up to enough. Um, but a, a few of the things that, you know, especially here in Minnesota, we're not generally concerned with sea level rise and uh, that kind of thing. We're experiencing climate change, but it's, it's a whole different, um, whole different order of magnitude when you start to hear some of the small island states that they're little, literally worried about the land beneath their feet going away. And you know what kind of uh, decisions do you have to make to move an entire country somewhere else? And you know it's just amazing to think of that. You know, that's their perspective in the negotiations, where we're you know, we're worried, worried about you know a slight change in our GDP or that kind of thing. Um, and then I guess just the, the fact that it's a, a really small world. So there's 30,000 plus people that were registered, but there was some people that you'd see, you know, a, a dozen times that you just, you know, see them walking in the hallway. Um, or the one night we were walking back from the bus, uh, it was about a 10 minute walk to where we were staying and the, the woman that got off the bus was walking the same direction, ended up staying at the same guest house that you were, Michelle. And she was on the Belize delegation that four days later, she was the person in he ahead of me in line at the airport to get checked in. And then we ended up on two of, the, two of my three flights, they were together, and including <laughs> like running across the Munich airport to get our next connecting <laughs> flight. So, um, or then the, the gal that works at the UN, lives in Bonn, Germany, originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, population of 18 million, but in our conversation found out that she did an, an exchange program in high school to Chatech, Wisconsin by Eau Claire. <laughs> <laughs> and just, you know, the, just the, you know, the, the crazy connections like that. Um, and then I guess the other thing, you, you probably saw the picture cycling through, getting, uh, getting a picture with Al Gore was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> and I guess that's one that was definitely a highlight, but um, I guess other uh, takeaways, uh, bringing back to the, my architecture firm, just uh, again the urgency and trying to push it and go uh, do more, uh, go faster in our energy reduction because um, you know, one thing I'm going to try and get us to join the We Are Still In campaign and look into um, some of the carbon offsets to try and go carbon neutral, because uh, I guess another thing that stood out, buildings are generally about 40% of global CO2 emissions. And so architects are, can either be a, a part of the problem or hopefully a part of the solution, but out of the, you know, I don't know how many people I've met or talked to there, I, I was the only architect that I know of. I didn't meet anyone else. I didn't hear of anyone else like, oh, I met another architect the other day. So it's just, it, oddly absent that there was, mm -hmm. you know, there was a few things in the pavilions that were dealing with building design from different countries, but generally the designer's voice was mm -hmm. absent. Very interesting. Great. Thanks mm -hmm. for sharing, Jesse. I did want to also say that um, Alyssa uh, Matthias uh, Tamasi from Target Corporation, she uh, is their corporate responsibility lead, also was part of our delegation. She unfortunately is sick today, so she's at home probably recovering from something she got on her trip. Um, but she did want me to read a statement, and she did say, attending COP24 was a fantastic opportunity to observe, learn, and connect with other business leaders. As the global community works to, uh, toward further reducing carbon emissions across all sectors, each sector is called upon to do their part, from government to businesses, investors, communities, and citizens. There is much work ahead. I left COP24 inspired and hopeful that as a business community and a global community, there will continue to be great ambition and urgency to work across sectors with the aim to further reduce carbon emissions. And then she does say, thank you again to Climate Generation for this wonderful opportunity. So, um, so I appreciate that. Um, I, I know there's probably some questions from the audience. I would love to have you um, uh, finish up those if you, if you don't. If you have a question you would like to have picked up, if you could kind of raise your hand and then uh, Lauren, who's our great communications uh, coordinator, will uh, will pick that up and bring that up to me. But while we're waiting to collect those, I'm just going to ask one more round of questions of some things. 
Um, if you didn't get a chance to follow the COP24 blogs that each of our delegates provided, I would really encourage you to go back. Um, you can check climategen.org uh, slash COP24. And all of the blogs are there as well as the webinars. We did live webinars with each of our delegates. And um, uh, Alyssa uh, Tem um, from Target, did, uh, she did a panel discussion. And I just really enjoyed all of your presentations. It was really helpful. I think it gives a great overview of what it's like to be at some of these negotiations. And so I just would encourage you to do that. And I'm just going to ask one more uh, round of questions. And then I'll get to our questions from our panelists. So, um, I know, um, uh, Alexis, that you were talking about um, some of your experiences there and some of the work that Best Buy is doing. I know that uh, they've really made great commitments. Uh, they know they have a 50% um, carbon reduction goal by uh, 2020. You're already 51% of the way there, which is phenomenal. You've really helped your, um, your customers uh, reduce with Energy Star appliances. You've saved over $700 million on the utility bills. So, um, so that's a really amazing work. You also uh, got a chance to attend the Sustainable Innovation Forum. And uh, one or two things I'd like you to talk about, either the circular economy or else this ambition loop, which was the first time I've heard this term. So can I just read what this is? An ambition loop is a positive feedback loop in which bold business leadership supports bold policy action that in turn accelerates further business action. So, actually I think I'm gonna have you jump into that one, but <laughs> <laughs> you would just talk about that a little bit and what that, what that felt like and what um, kind of how you, what's the takeaway from that? Sure, so the ambition loop is a report that um, a number of NGOs just put out maybe a month ago and it is, it is that, I, I'm glad you have the quote because I wouldn't have given it justice, but um, it really talks about how you need to have good policy that then enables uh, the business to drive forward solutions and then you need the business to actually push on policymakers and support policymakers in making better policy. So it's this loop where they kind of help each other be more ambitious. And um, I think it actually was a great, for me when I read that report, I thought, I thought, oh, no wonder why Climate Generation wanted a business delegation to go to COP24. And because at first, I, to me, it's a little bit of a, maybe a head scratcher for some. And when you go to the COP, at least um, this one, there were not a lot of businesses represented there and yet, mm -hmm. There's a lot of, you know, businesses put a lot of these things into action. Um, and so I think we, we need to be there um, driving forward some of these solutions. So I, that ambition loop um, is a concept that I think it, that really helped me think about what, what is our role and what can we do um, going forward on for climate change. Right. And I just want to say that our carbon goal within our operations is a 60% reduction by 2020. Oh, right. <laughs> Did I say 50%? Yeah, yeah. Oh, 60. <laughs> and we are at Anybody 50. See, emission loop. <laughs> and we are at 51%. So I think that, you know, the, for the ambition loop is, for example, you know, companies standing up and saying, no, we, we have a carbon goal and we have a commitment around this. And then government can say, okay, I get it. Some of my, my constituents and businesses are, are asking for this. Okay. So it's um, being supportive in that right. way. Of both of those, that's great. Wonderful, thanks for, yeah. thanks for explaining that. Um, Michelle, I have heard you give this quote, and I know you talked about some of the statistics that you have, and I, I will say when we were at COP21 um, in Paris, uh, I felt like agriculture was very underrepresented so I know you, uh, that came through in your blogs that there was, uh, there needs to be more emphasis. Sounds like there was a lot of meat served at this, <laughs> at this conference, which being in Poland, I guess, like you can yeah, see. But, yeah, Poland, um, yeah. but you've repeated a, a recent study by the University of Chicago that if every American ate one less meal per week um, of meat, it would be an annual equivalent of taking 500,000 cars off the road. Yeah. So it's really substantial. I just wondered if you would, I know you had you went to COP with the understanding that you wanted to, um, you know, educate on livestock effects and greenhouse gas. But I, I just are just a couple takeaways on that that you felt. 
Yeah, um, so, you know, it's hard to understand how food has an influence on this. Um, there's several things, and I learned so much when I was there with all of these really great researchers, but, um, you know, of course, food production, uh, you've got the um, process of uh, growing grain and corn and things like that, and it feeds animals, and you have the process that, uh, of water, of, you know, watering these things. Uh, and then the energy consumption of the transportation and the processing of the grains, and then we feed it to the animals, and then you know go through the and then we go through the whole production process again. So it's just a inefficient way for us to eat, right? It takes up a lot of energy transportation, so it kind of hits all of the uh, uh, touch points that you have um, when you talk about greenhouse gases. In addition, um, you know beef consumption just because. Our global economy is getting bigger, and you've got more middle class that can afford um, the luxury of of meat. Uh, that you have a lot more people that are eating it. So um, uh, there was a study that was done that the uh, dairy and livestock uh, industry expects to grow by 30 percent uh, by 2030. So I just thought about that, and I was there was a great um, there was a guy from Shell actually. Uh, that was giving a speech and he said one of his scenarios about how they're going to combat uh, climate change is reforestation. So I, my hand shot up and I'm like, how are you going to do reforestation when, you know, uh, meat and dairy is expected to grow by 30% uh, globally? And uh, he's like, great question, I don't know. He's like, this is not a plan, this is a scenario. <laughs> and uh, so it just... Um, it really is something that I don't think we think a lot about, um, but you know, cows and livestock, it, it takes up a lot of land, it takes up a lot of water, mm -hmm. and it's inefficient. So it was cool to see all of these, these uh, studies that were coming out of uh, that organization, uh, specifically uh, Oxford, but um, you know, a lot of other stuff, a um, lot of other academic uh, institutions there, so Great. really neat. All right, thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Appreciate that. Um, so, uh, Jesse, I had a question for you regarding, I know um, you had said 40% of buildings, um, uh, or um, I'm sorry, architecture, or the buildings themselves use 40% of our um, greenhouse gas emissions. And I know that BWBR has committed to architecture 2030. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to speak to that, a little bit of what that is, but also um, how did you, just what did you take from that? And, and how has that impacted your business at BWBR? Uh, yeah, I guess, so architecture, 2030 was an organization started about, uh, well, I think it's 2005 or 2006, uh, by an architect in New Mexico that uh, essentially looked at the CO2 emissions from buildings and trans transporting building materials and the whole life cycle of, of the building and set energy reduction targets based on an average building, which essentially um, some folks at, in Minnesota have done some further research to help define what the average is, and it's uh, essentially a building that was built to the 1989 building code. If you took all the buildings, that was sort of the average. Um, and they said, we need to decrease the energy use to, by 2030, we want to be at zero fossil fuel energy in our buildings. Mm -hmm. So every five years, they ramp it up by 10%. So initially, in 2005, we were shooting for a 50% reduction, and now we're at a 70% reduction with going towards 80% in 2020. Um, so that was the, the general concept, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's 2007 or 2008, uh, Minnesota uh, passed a law that state-funded buildings have to meet those same targets. Mm -hmm. um, so work that we do at the University of Minnesota, or other government facilities that we're required to hit the, the targets. Um, and then AIA, the American Institute of Architects, nationally started a 2030 commitment program, I think it was about 2010 that we signed on four years ago. Um, and that requires architects as uh, to look at our own business practices as far as what we do internally, but also report our projected building energy use uh, to a database, and then we track it every year, um, and they they issue an annual report. And what the reports have been showing is that generally we're not meeting the targets. There's a few bright spots, um, and we're improving nationally every year. But we 
again, we have a ways to go um, before 2030. So it's one of those things that we're, we're trying to push it. And, um, but the interesting thing for me and others in the office is we can hit the targets when we're required to. And so the state projects, um, like the, oh, I forget what the official name is, the, the new Minnesota legislative building. That that office building. Uh, mm -hmm. The Senate yes. office building. Yes, thank you. Um, it, uh, that was designed as a 100-year building and is a 73% energy reduction from average. So it's, mm -hmm. which, that was when it was designed. They've since installed solar panels on the roof, which further decrease the energy use. Um, so it just shows that uh, wise investments and good design, you can make a big difference, but it's just one of those things that as a design industry, as well as a public of designing and building buildings, we need to push ourselves to do more. Right. Sounds like part of that ambition loop again. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, there's a couple of questions that, um, that ask a, a similar question. Um, uh, so I'll just ask, I'll just read both of them, but you can answer whatever side of it. What was the image of the U.S. from the other nations? And then what did it feel like to be an American at the conference? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> who would like to start? Should we start with Jesse at the end uh, there? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, I guess I was, we talked about it before we left, of, you know, there, there may be some pushback. Um, and I guess I didn't really see or feel any personal pushback. Mm -hmm. I think it, generally I was just super impressed with the knowledge of the U.S. political system by uh, people from other countries that probably know it better than a lot of Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and they realized that you know, we uh, elected uh, someone that doesn't agree with what they're working towards, and I think they were all hopeful in two years that will change and we'll be uh, back, back in the negotiations and hopefully in a, a leadership position where we belong. Yeah, I similar experience. Everybody was really respectful. Um, didn't have a lot of uh, confrontations or questions. Um, there was just the obvious elephant in the room that um, at the conference there was a uh, gentleman. I can't remember his name, but he uh, came on behalf of the administration and he said, "We do not believe that the U.S. should risk its economic stability uh, and progress." Uh, for, uh, what do, you, do you remember exactly what he said? For uh, environmental sustainability, and, it, and I wrote in my blog that I just cannot believe that we're at a point where we don't uh, calculate the economic costs in, in the calculation. I mean, we're really, really sinking quickly, and I don't think we understand fully uh, insurance rates. I mean, I've seen them double and triple in the last couple of years. That's only going to keep increasing um, just everything, every facet of business is going to see huge increases. Um, I read something that the um, agriculture in Minnesota specifically, or maybe it was the Midwest, uh, the yields are expected to go down by you know anywhere from eight to 16 um, it, percent. It's just, it's just crazy to not be uh, calculating this into our, um, into our economy. So the only thing that I would add is that there, there's, you know, there's different levels of uh, the state organization that go to the conference of parties, and the top level we we didn't the U.S. didn't send anybody at the top level, but we sent negotiators, mm -hmm. and those negotiators were like at the table, they were in the dialogue, they were in the discussion, and I think that they were I think they're seen and widely respected by other countries. Mm -hmm. I think. So that, I think, was very positive um, association. So I, mm -hmm. that's what I would add. I thought it was interesting that um, in what I read that, uh, first of all, that um, the US was very involved, uh, really mm -hmm. pushing hard for transparency, like that mm -hmm. they were, um, that that was part of the um, negotiations. And that, um, that the rule book made it easy for the US to quickly re-enter the Paris Agreement, that that was something that was written in so that 
it would be an easy transition. It would only be a day or two, and they would be able to um, rejoin uh, uh, the negotiation. So, or the, actually sign hand to the agreement. So I, I thought that was um, interesting to see. Great. We have a couple questions on educators. Um, so I'll ask kind of a hybrid of this. How can educators both in K-12 and in higher education um, collaborate with and or leverage business committing to fighting climate change? So I guess uh, just an education related question. So how can, can you say it again? How can? Yeah, how can um, educators both K-12 and in higher education collaborate with and or leverage businesses committing to fighting climate change? So how can, how can educators, I guess, support businesses and help collaborate a little bit on that? Teach their students so that their students demand it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're probably already seeing that. I think, I think I remember hearing that your customers are already demanding this and your employees are demanding it. So mm -hmm. you probably yeah. are already seeing that. But yes, we certainly support teaching climate change <laughs> as our organization. So. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to, I, uh, Craig Johnson, who also joined us at, mm -hmm. the, uh, at the conference, he's a, uh, an, an educator and he uh, teaches a climate change uh, class in, uh, in a high school class. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to go out there and talk with them. So if you ever need me to get on my soapbox about food and, and climate change, I'm happy to. Uh, and then I just encourage, um, I encourage students just to reach out to business leaders. I think that we are underutilized and I think we want to be more of the conversation. Uh, obviously student groups that are um, you know, already active and excited about climate change and doing something uh, are great advocates for us because we can get our word out quicker. Um, you know, we, I'm sure there's great alliances so I would encourage reaching out to people like us. Yeah, uh, yeah what, what they said. <laughs> uh, no, I think it, it's a, a great, uh, there could be a great synergy there. Like when I left the office, we actually have a, uh, a group of, it's an ACE program where there's high school students that come in and uh, learn about design, but the same kind of thing could be done with any number of organizations on climate change. And I think there's, there's more and more resources out there for educators to use and you know, great organizations. Alexis, you had something else you wanted to add? I know, I, and it's maybe not exactly answering their question, mm -hmm. but um, I had a chance to, and maybe there's a picture up there of it, <laughs> of um, where I met and took a picture of with Greta Thunberg, the 15-year-old mm -hmm. Swedish activist. Mm -hmm. And it had, it just got me to reflect on her age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I also have a 15-year-old and I have two 12-year-olds, and it, it made me really think about okay, when these fifteen, when these, tw when my twelve-year-olds um, are just getting out of college, that's twenty thirty, mm -hmm. and you know, in the climate world, we're talking about twenty thirty all the time, and we're talking about twenty fifty all the time. Well, my fifteen-year-old in twenty fifty is going to be my age, yeah. and so I just like I think a month ago, if I were thinking about twenty fifty. And in, in the context of my, like, of my business, it feels so far away. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then when I look at it through the lens of Greta Thunberg and my 15-year-old, 2050 is in the middle of their life. And so it makes me think about, you know, they, they these high schoolers and middle schoolers, I mean, climate change is going to be a very real part of their lives. It's no longer, to me, it's no longer kind of grandchildren and like, oh, the seventh generation. It is very, it's, it's right here and it's going, it's really present in their life. Right. And so I, I think that maybe that's a call, maybe that's a call to educators to, to also realize that, um, that it's going to be a part of their lives and what are some of the tools that they'll need, the knowledge and tools that they'll need um, to, to live productively through that kind of a global change. Right. I will just say when we um, changed our name a few years ago, the reason we chose climate generation is we felt like this is really the first generation to understand, fully understand the implications of climate change. And we're also the last generation who can really 
change the trajectory of what happens with climate change. And I, I remember reading your blog about that age, and I think that that was real. I got goosebumps because I was, it was really powerful to put those years in perspective and recognize mm -hmm. that um, you know, those are your children who will be that age, not just these distant um, dates that are off in the future. Yeah, and I, it's hard to deny like, that, you're, that you're not planning for 2030 when you know, every month I put money away mm -hmm. for my kids' college education. So I am planning for 2030. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so right. it's, it, it is, it's closer than, than it sounds. Closer than we think. It is. Well, and I, I think just uh, that poses another question. Um, somebody said the IPCC report printed a dire picture. Uh, I, um, what left you feeling most hopeful when leaving the COP? Uh, we know just for those, I, I think everybody here and probably listening online knows that the IPCC report basically said that we have uh, you know, 10 to 12 years to really turn our, uh, to get off of fossil fuels and, and really change the trajectory um, in our economy. And, and so just wondering what, what did leave you with hope and made you feel like um, we can get there? Because I know it also, just even some of the statistics that when the gentleman who said, we're not even planning for one and a half, we're planning for six degrees. And, yeah. um, but what, what still felt like it filled you with hope? Any? I guess I'll, I'll start. Yeah. Um, the Sustainable Innovation Forum that I think three of us attended there was some really interesting uh, technology uh, folks that were there uh, talking about their different you know, companies and inventions that they have, mm -hmm. um, as well as uh, I heard more about blockchain in one day than I have <laughs> in the previous 40 years of my life. Um, Does everybody know what that is, it, the Bitcoin it, yeah, it's technology? Yes, the, the technology behind Bitcoin, but they were using it in a, a carbon finance way that you can, and there's at least like three different companies that were starting um, a way that you could invest in uh, your carbon reduction that through blockchain would go directly to the people on the ground. Like one company mm -hmm. is working with people in the Amazon. So you could invest with them and you would know, okay, this is the project that we're doing and you know it's right there um, versus you know, having it be more of a nebulous, feel-good kind of investment thing. You can see that it's actually specific farmers um, that are doing work to, you know, if it's afforestation or other um, other practices that are sequestering carbon. So I think that was one one really uh, interesting thing that will likely be taking off in the next few years. Mm -hmm. yeah. I I feel like I'm an optimistic person. <laughs> Um, and I've already kind of talked about some of the hope, but, and I, I focus primarily just due to Best Buy on the electricity sector. Mm -hmm. And I, so it's probably different than some of the other sectors, but with electricity, I feel like I said, the technology is ready and it's ready for scale. And one of the, and that to me is really hopeful. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was really exciting when I was there, when Al Gore was up on stage and he you know he's talking to this international audience his whole presentation is very internationally focused and then up on the screen he pulls up Excel Energy's recent announcement mm -hmm. um, and so it's things like that I think that are hopefully we'll see more of those um, transformations right. and they were the first utility that has committed to 100% it's huge. Yeah, yeah, it is huge. I mean, the first utility. So I, I was really excited for them when I was here and I heard about the announcement, mm -hmm. but when I was there and I saw the context mm -hmm. of, oh, this is this is bigger than Minnesota and you know their five state region here. This is, ah, this is an example of a utility that is transforming their mm -hmm. business model. Right. And that that was I, that's why I think it made it to the stage. Right. And that that was really exciting. So right. I think there's. A lot, to hope, a lot to hope for in that sector. I am um, the, it did, there were swings of like <laughs> despair, <laughs> for sure. It was one of the uh, hardest things, you know, you just tried to like uh, not cry it, uh, you know, interpret all the data and not be discouraged. But uh, one of the things just from the food industry that I noticed is that 
Um, you know, you go to a session and when you talk about chefs or when you talk about foodies and when you talk about fashion, mm -hmm. those were all kind of the things that um, people's ears perked up and they started getting more interested. And just like in America, just like all over the world, we're, you know, an Instagram nation and we're for good or bad, you know, we're sort of uh, going, you know, we're, we're all about culture. And um, the thing that I feel most hopeful is that, uh, you know, one of the biggest shifts, at least in chef world, is people going to plant-based and, and doing new things uh, with food. And so we definitely can transform this. Uh, it's kind of, I kind of liken it to uh, recycling, you know, 30 years ago, people, I, my, I grew up in Colorado Springs, nobody recycled in my town and it was, you know, people didn't really know what it was. Now when you throw something plastic away in a garbage, you really feel like you're doing bad. You know, you recognize that your action is, is bad. So I think that a lot of these behaviors, um, whether it's, you know, starting a building and realizing that it's going to have terrible energy efficiency, it just won't feel right. And, mm -hmm. And so I hope that society, um, you know, I, I, I think we're starting to internalize what's right and wrong about um, energy and, and food and all of these areas. So I think that's uh, hopefully what, what causes us to change the, the um, fashion and the, the uh, culture wars. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, I just wanted to ask you quickly, Alexis, somebody had asked about the um, recycling program, the recycling market, and I know that um, Best Buy is one of the biggest, uh, you, you do take out back all the products that you produce, and, um, and I know that you really try to provide more longevity with your products, but uh, can you speak to like what has happened with the world recycling market? I don't know if that impacts mm -hmm. like some of the things that you have, but uh, some of the products yeah. that you're trying to recycle. Yeah, so Best Buy, we have a um, large focus on kind of e-waste and more broadly now the language of kind of circular economy. Mm -hmm. So we have our Geek Squad repair business where we're trying to extend the life of technology through mm -hmm. repairing it. And it, it's we repair 5 million customer products each year. Okay. Um, and then a trade-in program, we have a parts store, so we've got a number of programs, and then we also have a recycling program. So our recycling program, um, at any store, you can bring back consumer electronics. We have some restrictions, um, so always check the website, but mm -hmm. most, pretty much, um, most consumer electronics we'll take back in our store. Um, and that uh, program, we have a goal to collect 2 billion pounds by the end of 2020, and um, we are now at 1.7 billion pounds um, as of the end of last year. So we're on our way. I think we're going to make it, so that's good. Uh, without a doubt, the, there's been some challenges in um, on the e-way side, and then also just on, I think, what's more talked about um, more globally is on the, the just the pure kind of recycling mm -hmm. side. Uh, and so as a, as a business, we've, we've been kind of maneuvering. The team has been really doing, I think, a great job of trying to make sure that they're finding vendors that have good outlets. Mm -hmm. um, so it's absolutely something that the team at Best Buy has been tackling and working on. And it, it is, you know, there's always something to keep us on our toes and keep us challenged. So right. they've been working on it. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. So luck, we've been lucky to be able to find to still find markets, still find it. markets, that's still good. find vendors that we can work with. I mean, I think that that's probably the beauty of being a, a large, um, a large company that takes back a lot of material. So right, right. We've got a history there and good partnerships. Great, um, Jesse. I know you um, mentioned Al Gore and getting to a chance to meet him. I met him the same way you did, literally walking down the hallway, and he just I just literally ran into him. So. <laughs> Um, but I know you had uh, provided a quote in your blogs that 17 of the 18 hottest years on record have occurred since 2001, and 2018 will be added to that list in a few weeks. Um, just, I know that you are um, a content reality presenter too, and, and just um, how, how are you um, taking that back to your business, and, and do you find that that does help up, uh, ramp up the ambition that you're doing for a building design? And, 
I, it's one of one of many things that we've got um, in the works of trying to trying to educate our clients um, early on in the building design mm -hmm. of you know, the the issues that buildings have on the environment and how we can you know, design smarter, or design better mm -hmm. to try and minimize those impacts, or if it's a a renovation of trying to preserve as much of the building as we can because it's the, the structure itself has a lot of embodied energy and likely a lot of uh, useful life left in it, um, depending on what the, the project is. But right. okay. <coughs> Michelle, I know that you were really impressed with the three million tree, uh, uh, three trillion, trillion trees. Trillion. <laughs> I was gonna say, wait, that's a T with a trillion. Um, and you have now committed to every customer who comes to Fig and Farrow that you, they will you will plant a tree. Can you tell us about that quickly? Just we to just had a meeting on it today with my marketing director and my GM, and they're like, "What did you sign us up for? <laughs> <laughs> what did you commit us to?" Um, so one of the greatest. Uh, this was so inspirational. One of the uh, greatest organizations that I met there was an uh, organization called Plant for the Planet. And they connect uh, businesses with uh, tree planters from all over the world. Um, apparently, there's a whole industry of, you know, you can get a 10 cent tree planted, you can get a dollar uh, tree planted, uh, and they do different functions. Uh, some of them last longer than others, some of them are um, support, you know, local economies and farmers a lot better than others. Uh, but they have, you know, a, a really cool app that allows you to compete against other companies. So we're actually going to sign up there and um, make sure that, uh, you know, maybe we'll challenge these guys and see how many uh, trees we can plant. Um, but it's really great, and it got me thinking about how businesses like. I don't know, Starbucks, how many people uh, go to Starbucks every single day? And if they are doing the 10 cent program where they are just raising their you know, coffee 10 cents, which I don't think any of us would really notice, mm -hmm. uh, but a, a tree was planted. Those are kind of the big numbers. I can't do that through my restaurant, uh, you know, do three trillion trees, uh, but uh, somebody like a Starbucks can. So um, I want to think about innovative ways that we can encourage businesses that have high, uh, um, consumer engagement and try to figure out a way that they can be also, you know, planting a tree every time they sell their product. Great. Well, thank you for that. I know we need to wrap up, but I just wondered if we just do one word. What was just one takeaway that you'd like to have? Ambition. Yay! Okay. I'm going to say ambition too. I feel like empowered. <laughs> <laughs> ambition We're going to do this. Yes. Uh, I'll stick with A, but go amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Well, great. Well, I will say our delegates really are amazing. It was really um, wonderful to be a part of your week at, at weeks at, at COP. And so um, thank you very much for taking the time to share. I know that you didn't get a lot of sleep no. or eat no. a lot. No. So we <laughs> no food, no we know sleep. that that's the case. Yes. That's, um, and exhausting. 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 Uh, yes, we know that. Well, great. Well, thanks to all of you here. Thanks to anybody online. and. Uh, Again, I would encourage you to check climategen.org slash COP24 just to read a little bit more about the experience and, um, and engage in the work. So thank you. There's Appreciate you. Oh, and there's a reception right next door. Sorry for those online. Yeah. Uh, but there's, you can come on over. Uh, reception right next door, and uh, we'd love to have you join us for that. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks.